started uh, with the meeting. Uh, thank you uh, for joining uh, the meeting today. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to do so. Uh, we're here today to talk about uh, the Port of Plains Corridor Interstate Feasibility Study that we have been working on. Uh, we're also going to uh, share some of the preliminary recommendations that have been developed and would like to get your uh, input and feedback on those. Uh, before we get started, I would like to go through uh, some uh, ground rules here. Uh, first of all, uh, like I said, uh, welcome again uh, to everyone. Um, as, uh, just for the benefit of those who have joined by just phone, uh, I'm just going to read some of the instructions that we have on the slides here. Um, so the first bullet here says, uh, welcome to the Postal Plains Corridor Feasibility Study. Uh, please type your name in the chat box, and if you have logged in by uh, using your computer, definitely please uh, feel free to type your name there. That way we can take credit for your participation. And also after the presentation, uh, please be sure to sign in uh, the meeting's uh, website landing page, the virtual meeting page that you might have used to uh, log in. Uh, please ensure that both your phone and your computer microphones are muted. Um, this minimizes background noise. Periodically check to make sure the devices are uh, muted unless uh, you, you are speaking at that time. And to share a comment or ask a question, uh, you may add it to the chat box on the right side of the screen. And if you're not using a computer, if you're just calling in, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, after the presentation, the attendees can unmute their devices for the question and answer session. So we have a separate dedicated question and answer session towards the end of this presentation. So if you prefer to, you could definitely hold on and ask your questions towards the end as well. And throughout the presentation, our study team is monitoring the chat box. So we will be responding to the questions that come through the chat box as well. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the purpose of this meeting uh, is to provide the public an opportunity to learn about the Port Plains Corridor feasibility study, the interstate feasibility study that is being conducted, and to provide your input on the preliminary recommendations. The Port Plains Advisory Committee has developed preliminary recommendations for this corridor, so we are uh, seeking uh, your input and feedback on those recommendations that have been developed. And now this presentation will include both audio and visual components, and it will be made in English. And the meeting is being recorded, and it will be available online for public viewing through Thursday, September 10th, 2020. Uh, in addition to this uh, recording, uh, we also have a lot of uh, project information and materials that are posted on the Techstart web page. Uh, so you could go to techstart.gov, uh, use the search feature on the top right, uh, you could type in Ports to Plains, and that will take you uh, to several different links that will give you information on the Ports to Plains study that is being conducted. I also want to mention that all comments must be received on or before Thursday, September 10th, and that will help us incorporate your comments as the study progresses through. The comments can be submitted in different formats. Um, you could submit uh, written comments, um, and from the public regarding the study are requested, and uh, they can be submitted by email. The email ID that uh, you would be using if you're choosing to do by email would be ports to planes at textdot.gov. Uh, you could also send the comments in by uh, regular mail, uh, in which case you could mail it to Texas Department of Transportation, uh, care of ports to planes study team, 5835. Callahan Road, Suite 200, San Antonio, Texas, 78228. Uh, this address and the email ID is also provided on the web page, so you could pull the same information from the project web page as well. The online comment form is provided on the web page. Uh, you could submit your comments directly on the web page itself, or you could choose to print a comment form and submit your comments that way. The both formats are available through our techstart.gov web page. And if you would like to call, uh, you could use this phone number for any questions about the project. And the phone number is 512-486-5106. Again, it is 512-486-5106.
Uh, this slide here uh, just gives you a quick overview of the virtual meeting landing page. Um, you, you can see several different options that are available here for you to explore on that web page. On the top left, you have the sign in box where you can go sign in and uh, get your handouts. And the box below provides the recommendation maps. These are the projects uh, that have been recommended by the Ports Plains Advisory Committee. And then on the right side, there is a box that says submit a comment. So you could click there and get the comments form and also submit your comments online. So this is some uh, basic pointers that I wanted to mention before we get started here. And uh, definitely, as always, uh, Techstar is looking for your feedback. Uh, your input is very critical for the study. Uh, so we really look forward to getting your uh, input and feedback on this particular study. Today's presentation uh, is uh, divided into four different discussion topics. And the first one uh, is the House Bill 1079 overview. Uh, so we'll start off with a quick overview of the House Bill uh, that has initiated the study. Uh, the second session will focus on the feasibility study findings. So we've been working on the study for about a year now. Uh, so we will uh, talk about uh, all the different analysis that has been completed and the findings from the study. The third section I will focus on the Ports of Plains Advisory Committee preliminary recommendations. This is where I would like to request your feedback and thoughts um, because these are the recommendations that are being made by the committee. And the last session uh, will be about uh, the Advisory Committee's implementation plan where we basically phase out the different recommended projects um, by the uh, Ports of Plains Advisory Committee. So those are the four different uh, uh, topic sessions that we'll be going through in today's presentation. We'll start off uh, with the House Bill 1079 overview. What do you think up here on the slide? Um, say, now basically House Bill 1079 requires Six Dart to conduct a comprehensive feasibility study of the Port of Plains corridor. And if you were to look at um, the verbatim in the bill, um, it, it states that the study must evaluate the feasibility of costs logistical matters associated with improvements to the corridor that create a continuous flow four lane divided highway that meets interstate standards to the extent possible. Uh, so that's the uh, origin of the study. The study is being conducted as it is being required by the House Bill 1079. The bill also requires uh, that uh, an advisory committee be established and also segment committees be established um, so as per the requirements, these committees have been established. Um, the advisory committee uh, is required to meet uh, at least twice annually. Uh, I think we have been meeting more than that, more frequently than that. Uh, the membership to the advisory committee uh, is limited as required by the bill. Uh, the bill states that the membership should include elected officials um, or their specific appointees um, all along the corridor. So that's what the membership is comprised of for the advisory committee. Um, the advisory committee has been reviewing uh, the reports uh, from the segment committees and based on that, they are currently working and developing uh, their advisory committee uh, report. TechStart in turn will take the advisory committee report and develop the final feasibility study for this corridor. Now this slide here gives you an overview of the entire corridor. Uh, the map on the left side of the screen uh, is the entire corridor all the way from uh, the state borders in New Mexico and Oklahoma to um, the southern border at Laredo. Uh, the corridor for the purpose of the study has been divided into three segments. Uh, the first segment uh, is from segment one is from New Mexico and Oklahoma border to Hale Lubbock County uh, shown on the right side of the screen um, in red, the topmost uh, section segment. Uh, segment two, which is shown in green on the map, uh, runs from Hale Lubbock County line to Sutton Edwards County line. And segment three is from Sutton Edwards County line uh, to the international border at I-35 Lincoln Bridge. Uh, this slide here gives you a big picture uh, view of the key milestones for the study. On August 29th, uh, 2019, uh, just about a year ago, 
um, the Texas, Texas Transportation Commission minute order was adopted. So that's when officially the study was kicked off and uh, we started working on the study. And since then, uh, the, the Ports of Plains Advisory Committee and Segment Committees have been established and they have been working on the study. Uh, as recently as June 30th, 2020, about two months ago, um, the segment committee reports were submitted, were finalized and submitted to the advisory committee. And the next milestone we are working towards is October 31st, 2020, when the advisory committee um, report and final recommendations will be finalized and submitted to TechStart. And TechStart in turn uh, will submit to the governor and legislature on uh, January 1st, 2021. So by the end of this year, the study would be completed. So those were uh, some key aspects from House Bill uh, 1079. Uh, moving along, the next session, we'll look at uh, the feasibility study findings. Uh, this slide here uh, gives you an overview of the study scope and all the different components uh, of this particular study. Um, the first step here is definitely House Bill 1079, which required the study. Um, and then we, we first looked at the existing conditions and forecasted conditions in the corridor, followed by an interstate feasibility analysis. So we looked at the feasibility of an interstate uh, along this corridor, and that led to the development of uh, preliminary recommendations for this corridor, which was then uh, fine-tuned to get to final recommendations and implementation plan, and that will again feed into the feed feasibility study report. And throughout this process, stakeholder and public engagement has been key. Uh, we have been seeking uh, your input and feedback and incorporating th that in the study process. We'll now uh, look into some of the, uh, in a big picture overview of the current and future corridor uh, assessment that, has, that was completed as part of the study. This slide here uh, gives you a corridor-wide characteristics. Um, the corridor is 963 miles long, uh, so it is definitely a long corridor and primarily spans the rural and west Texas, west and as well as south Texas. Um, it is designated by Congress as a high-priority corridor on the national highway system. Uh, this was done back in 1998. Uh, this is definitely a long corridor and spans a total of 26 counties. And there are three major uh, ports of entries that contribute to the traffic along the corridor, uh, those being Laredo, Eagle Pass, and Del Rio. Uh, these are major uh, trade gateways, not just for the states, uh, but also for uh, the nation as a whole. This slide here uh, gives an uh, overview of the population um, analysis that was done. Uh, we looked at both the historic population as well as the future trends of population growth along the corridor. As you can see on the bar chart on the left, um, from 1990 to, to 2050, it is a steady growth that's being expected. Uh, so from 1990 to uh, 2017, an increase of 33% was noted. Uh, and from 2020 to 2050, uh, the population is expected to increase by 61%. That's a pretty significant growth in population there. Uh, another metric that we looked at was the median household income. Um, this grew from about 21,400 in 1990 to about 50,000 in 2017. This was an increase of 137,000. And the projected growth um, is from 50,500 uh, in 2020 to about 131,500 in 2050 which is a much more significant growth of 161%. That's definitely a big increase that's expected there. Other metrics that we looked at are employment growth and uh, gross dom domestic product GDP. Um, the employment from 1990 to 2017 grew by 37%, and it is expected to grow by 17% between 2020 and 2050. And the GDP is projected to grow from 155,000 million in 2020 to 263,000 million in 2050. And this is an increase of 69%. And that's a huge, and a huge increase that is anticipated here for this region. So overall, we, have, we are seeing um, positive growth trends in many friends for this corridor. 
Um, other metric that we looked at uh, was definitely the traffic volumes along the corridor, and the traffic volumes are projected to increase 67% uh, from uh, 2018 to 2050. And when you look at just the truck volumes, um, that truck volume is expected to increase by 73% between 2018 and 2050. And now, um, if you look at roadways north of San Angelo, you're seeing a slightly higher truck traffic uh, percentage over there related to the southern sections of the corridor. And Laredo is definitely uh, the highest truck traffic volumes are noted in Laredo uh, near the I-35 uh, corridor. Another aspect that we looked at uh, was the safety. Um, so between uh, 2014 and 2018, a uh, total of 17,554 crashes were recorded, um, and 242 of them were actually fatal crashes, and which unfortunately resulted in about 297 fatalities. Um, now, another analysis that was done was the crash rates, uh, where we compare the traffic volumes against the number of crashes. And when we look at crash rates, um, the highest crash rates were recorded through Amarillo, Big Spring, Midland, San Angelo, Sonora, and Del Rio. That is a quick summary of the safety analysis that was done. And this slide here uh, shows uh, the freight movement, the anticipated uh, freight movement along the corridor. Um, the map to the left of the screen shows the 2050 total freight tonnage um, that is anticipated to and from all the counties that are there along the Portal Plains Corridor. Uh, the big uh, red thick lines that you're seeing represent a uh, high tonnage of about 10 million to 22.5 million. And the uh, orange lines uh, represent the slightly lower tonnage, about a million to 10 million. And then followed by the CN lines that you see, and then followed by the pink lines that you see. So definitely I-27, 44, 45, uh, followed by I-20, I-10 are all uh, key uh, uh, contributors of um, tonnage to and from the Port Plains Corridor. With that, um, I'll pass it on to my study team, uh, Wendy Travis, to continue with analysis and findings. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about um, the study analysis that we did for the feasibility study. Um, we looked at the goals of House Bill 1079, um, and we evaluated two scenarios. The first scenario was a 2050 non-interstate, which that scenario is defined as the existing corridor plus any already planned and programmed projects. And then the second scenario we looked at would be an interstate upgrade of the Ports to Plains corridor. The first goal we looked at was facilitating freight movement. So this map on the right is one that uh, Keila just discussed with you that shows the 2050 freight tonnage. And as you can see, the interstate we found was projected to carry an additional 5,100 trucks per day in 2050, which is an increase of about 34% over the non-interstate. So it is allowing freight to move more um, efficiently through the corridor. The interstate also would improve the travel times, at a, um, especially in peak periods, and it would um, allow trucks to not um, ca it's, uh, cause delays in moving and also in accidents. So the second one was the ability of the energy industry to transport products to market. Um, the interstate was projected to add about 76 million freight tons, which is about 99% above the non-interstate. And that currently roughly half of the freight tons are energy related that were in the corridor. Um, so a in the future too, a significant portion of the freight that's expected to um, go through the corridor is freight as re energy related. And as I said, it would improve travel times and also increase the ability of the energy industry to get their products to market and also in a reliable way too. So the third thing we looked at was traffic congestion. And so the, the map on the right shows the differences in traffic in 2050. So the green lines are um, the heavier lines. As they get heavier, that's more traffic. Um, the red lines are less traffic. So what we found was the interstate has the capacity um, with more capacity to actually divert traffic from other facilities in the region, in the state, and nationally as well as inter internationally. So what we found is the interstate would actually divert traffic from other facilities such as 
um, US 85, uh, 385 south of Hartley, US 84 between Lubbock and I-20, and then US 57 in um, El Paso to San Antonio. And that's just a few of the facilities that it would divert traffic from. And then nationally, it would divert traffic from I-10, I-35, which currently I-35 is the only real north-south interstate um, going from Mexico out of the state of Texas. And then it would also divert trips from Mexico to Midwestern states as well. Next, we looked at the ability of the, the corridor to promote safety and mobility. What we found is the interstate would, would reduce crashes by about 21% over the non-interstate in 2050, which is pretty significant. Um, in addition, the interstate would provide a benefit to travel times. And what we found just on average travel times is the interstate would um, actually produce a savings of an hour and a half quarter watt of the, throughout the length of the quarter, which is pretty substantial. So the map on the right shows the um, travel time savings the um, between different city, city pairs in the corridor. So the black um, numbers show the existing travel time. The numbers in orange show the reduction of the non-interstate and in travel time in minutes. And then the blue numbers show the reduction in interstate travel time. So as you can see between every city pair in the corridor, there is a pretty good substantial reduction in travel time minutes with the non-interstate. In some, I mean, with the interstate, sorry. And in some cases, the non-interstate doesn't produce any reduction in travel time in the year 2050. Um, we also looked at um, the interstate suitability. So there are three methods that you can use to obtain interstate designation. One is the USDOT secretary can designate if the corridor currently meets interstate standards. And then the secretary of the United States Department of Transportation can actually um, approve it as an interstate facility. Also, TxDOT can submit a proposal to the USDOT secretary requesting interstate designation of a corridor. And then the third way is by a congressional act. We, in addition, we looked at the cost of what it would cost to upgrade the corridor to interstate standards. And what we found is the cost would be about $23.5 billion. Currently, there's about 811 miles of the corridor that are not interstate, um, that are not to the interstate standards. They're four lane divided or two lane divided or something less than uh, interstate standard. So that would be about $23.5 billion. And this is a planning level estimate. So those changes could be, those costs could be modified as individual projects are developed and, ref and further refined. Um, we also looked at the economic development impacts of the corridor, upgrading the corridor to interstate standards. So these are statewide impacts. So um, the annual travel cost savings would be $4.1 billion by the year 2050. Um, the annual increase in GDP would be $2.8 billion. And then the total increase in employment as a result of upgrading this corridor to an interstate would be 22,000 jobs. That return on investment, which would be basically the, the return that we get on that $23.5 billion investment in the state of Texas will be 76%, which is a $17 billion net return on investment, which is pretty substantial. Um, the benefit cost ratio, which would be the, the benefit of, inter, of upgrading to interstate versus the cost, um, would be a 2.4, which anything greater than one is um, a good investment. So 2.4 is a great investment. And then next, I would just want to show you the breakdown in those quarter wide travel costs that I talked about that $4.1 billion would break down into savings and in vehicle operating costs, savings and shipper costs, savings in personal and business time and reliability. So $4.1 billion is pretty significant. Last, I just want to talk that the, this is a, um, you know, a, a, a proposal by the advisory committee and um, of how this, pro this project could be brought up to an interstate standard and also the implementation plan. Currently, it doesn't have funding um, committed to it, but we did look at potential sources of funding. And there's three different types of funding that would be federal, state, and local funding. The federal level, you have the federal aid highway program. You also have several grant programs, the USDOT build grant program, 
as well as the infrastructure grant uh, for a rebuilding America grant program. And then at the state level, you have several funding sources as well. Um, Proposition one, um, as well as Proposition seven would be applicable to this corridor. The state infrastructure bank could be used as well as the state highway fund. And then also um, Senate Bill 500 and House Bill 1 uh, provided funds for county roads and energy sectors, so that could be used for this corridor as well. And then all of that funding would be um, coordinated through the metropolitan planning organizations in the urban areas, such as Amarillo, Lubbock, San Angelo, Midland, Odessa, and Laredo. Next, Steve is going to present the advisory committee's preliminary recommendations. I'm Steve Linhart, Project Development Manager with the Texas Department of Transportation. The advisory committee has developed three general categories of project recommendations for the Ports to Plains corridor. This is interstate upgrade, relief routes, and safety and operational improvements. This slide shows the interstate upgrade improvements the advisory committee is recommending that the entire Ports of Plains corridor uh, be upgraded to interstate standards. The table on the right lists the general locations of sections of the corridor from the Panhandle uh, to Sterling City. This slide is a continuation of the previous slide where it shows the recommended interstate upgrade locations from Midland to Interstate 35, uh, that's the table on the right. Some of the existing roadways of the Ports of Plains corridor extend through towns and urban communities and uh, widening or improving those existing roads uh, may significantly impact those communities. And recognizing this, the advisory committee, the advisory committee is also recommending relief routes to be constructed around urban areas uh, along the corridor, and these relief routes would be constructed to interstate standards. So the table on the right lists the locations of cities uh, recommended to have a relief route uh, from the Panhandle to Sterling City. And this is a continuation of that slide showing the corridor and the relief route locations from uh, listed on the right, from the city of Water Valley to around the city of Katerina. And I just wanted to point out to you that there have been a couple of studies that are underway in San Angelo and Sonora and in the Eagle Pass area to look at improvements and uh, relief route options. The third category is safety and operational improvements. And uh, this slide uh, shows there's a number of subcategories uh, within the safety and operational improvements. Um, shown here is the intersection improvements. As you can see on the map on the left, um, they're, they're scattered throughout the, uh, the Ports of Plains corridor uh, with a concentration sort of in the mid corridor. The next subcategory of, of safety and operational improvements are interchange projects. Uh, most of them are located in the Lubbock area, and then there is a, an interchange project identified that's recommended uh, in the southern part of the corridor at I-35 and US-83. The next subcategory is access and safety improvements. As you can see on the map on the left, these are sort of scattered throughout the corridor, and these would include um, these would be improvements such as roadway geometry uh, improvements, uh, drainage, and other sort of access management improvements. The unique feature of the corridor is that there are some border patrol uh, inspection stations and checkpoints. Uh, within here and the, okay, advisory Chad, committee, the advisory committee has identified Let's uh, do of these. the uh, if you could mute yourself here. please you could uh, please mute yourself if you're not speaking please that'll help us thank you 
So the advisory committee has identified uh, three locations along the Ports of the Plains corridor uh, where they would look to expand the uh, Border Patrol facilities or possibly relocate them as part of uh, uh, their preliminary recommendations. And then the final category the advisory committee had identified were a couple of uh, overpass locations uh, that would warrant further study. These were identified in the uh, southern Sutton County, northern Edwards County uh, area of the project corridor. So this slide is a, just a summary of the advisory committee's preliminary recommendations. On the left, the map just shows the locations of the uh, interstate upgrades, which is proposed for the entire corridor, as well as uh, areas for uh, relief routes. Then the graphic on the right shows the safety and operational improvement locations throughout the corridor. Next, I'm gonna present on the advisory committee implementation plan. Um, this advisory committee has developed the suggested implementation plan of these recommendations. So the implementation plan is, is a range of short term from zero to five years, mid term six to 10 years, and long term 11 plus years. And this is uh, for project planning when project planning would start in those windows. Uh, there's various funding sources that would need to be explored to construct the recommended projects. As Wendy had mentioned previously, there's no dedicated funding identified uh, for improvements to the Ports of the Plains corridor. So projects starting in the short term, zero to five year range, the advisory committee is recommending 11 interstate upgrade projects and 21 relief route projects. And as you see on the graphic on the left, these are scattered throughout the entire corridor. Projects starting in the midterm, the six to 10 year range, the advisory committee has identified seven interstate upgrade projects and four relief route projects. As noted on the graphic on the left, these generally are from the mid corridor uh, north to the uh, Panhandle area. Then the project starting in the long term, 11 plus years, the advisory committee has identified two interstate upgrade projects and one relief route project. And these are located in the uppermost part of the Panhandle next to the New Mexico and Oklahoma line, uh, state lines. So just to summarize uh, the advisory committee's suggested implementation plan, there are 20 interstate upgrade projects, 11 starting in the short term, seven starting in the midterm, two starting in the long term, and 26 relief route projects, 21 starting in the short term, four starting in the midterm, and one starting in the long term. And please note that the safety and operational improvement projects that uh, the advisory committee has recommended, those would be constructed in conjunction with the interstate upgrade and relief route projects. Great, uh, thank you, Steve. So with that, uh, I think uh, we come uh, to the last session of this presentation, which is the Q&A session. Um, Please feel free to type your question in the chat box or unmute yourself and ask the question using your phone. Also want to mention that uh, the recommendation maps uh, that Steve just went over are also available on the website. Uh, so if you'd like to look at it, zoom in and zoom out or print it out, you're uh, welcome to please visit the website and you should be able to access all the information there as well. I'd uh, really encourage you all to actively participate and ask uh, any questions that you might have or share any thoughts uh, based on what you heard today. 
Uh, we had the uh, same presentation that was given yesterday. Uh, we, we saw a lot of uh, good present questions that had come up yesterday. So we'd love to um, be able to see some questions and provide any clarifications that we could. Uh, so please don't hesitate, uh, not use the chat box, or use the mic, whatever is convenient for you. Great, I'm seeing some uh, questions come through the chat box. Have the locations for the relief routes been identified yet? In particular, the one that is recommended for La Mesa. I would say uh, as part of this feasibility study, the locations have not been identified yet. Now, what has been identified is that um, a relief route study will be done for La Mesa. So once we get to the next phase, when, when we start looking at each of these individual projects and start working on those, We'll definitely consult with the community there um, and then uh, move forward with looking at other uh, options to consider for relief routes over there. Hopefully that answered your questions. Uh, please let please let me know if you have any follow-up question. Um, the next question that I'm seeing is uh, when will the governor or legislature give their input on the 2021 recommendations? Uh, that's a great question. Akila, can yeah. I, uh, let, me, let me take that. This is uh, Caroline Mays uh, with TechStart. Um, as part of what was outlined in the bill, there were kind of uh, three or four uh, deadlines on when reports were supposed to be submitted. The segment committee was required to develop the report and submit it to the advisory committee on June 30th. That was done. The advisory committee right now is developing their final report and the uh, preliminary recommendations that was presented today. Uh, and they're required to submit that report to TechStart by October 30th. And then TechStart gets that report and then TechStart will submit the report uh, to the governor's office, to uh, Lieutenant Governor and several elected officials at the legislators by January 1st, 2021. And at that time, they will, the governor and all the elected officials will review uh, the report and the recommendations from the advisory committee. And then, uh, you know, suddenly they will weigh in uh, in the recommendations. But as you know, uh, two elected officials that sponsored the bill have been participating in the advisory and segment committee meetings and they've been monitoring uh, the study as uh, we move forward with the development of the plan. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Caroline. And, yep, better go ahead. You can read the question, the next question, and then I can answer that. Okay. Yeah, so the next question uh, says, uh, where can we find the cost estimates for the projects in each of the timelines? Um, since this is a high level planning study, the cost estimate you've seen earlier, that is the cost estimate for the entire corridor. We did not break uh, the cost estimate for each project uh, as um, TxDOT district working with uh, each of the local communities will have to uh, advance the projects that have outlined in the plan uh, through what we call project development process. So uh, none of these projects were ready uh, to construct tomorrow. There's a lot of things that need to happen. They have to look at each project and see uh, what needs to be done, whether they need right away, they need to do environmental review and analysis, they have to do uh, preliminary uh, design, all of those things and constructions need to be done at a project level. So the cost estimate that's provided in this is, is a global cost estimate uh, based on, you know, the number of miles and some of the other factors. And we do have a lot of that information detailed in the segment committee report on how we came up with, uh, you know, the analysis and the estimation of the cost. But Specific costs will be done at the project level. Okay. Uh, the next question that we have, Caroline, is uh, if we have been identified as a landowner in a possible relief route near San Angelo, when will the decision be made for the final route? 
Okay, can I just, there's a question I would ask about the legislators involved um, in the study. Uh, we have, um, and I always mix them up, uh, I think Duffy or um, Sherry on the line is uh, Senator Perry and Representative Paul Price. Those were the two uh, elected officials that sponsored the bill. So that's Senator Perry and then Representative uh, Paul Price are the two. Yes, so Akila, the next question. Yes, so the next question is, if you have been identified as a landowner in a possible relief route near San Angelo, when will the decision be made for the final route? Well, so I'll answer this um, globally. The relief routes that have been identified here, each of them will require uh, specific uh, studies to look at the feasibility uh, and have uh, community input, environment assessment. So there's a lot that goes into it. This is just, we've just identified that these are places we need to be looking at relief routes. In the case of San Angelo, uh, the district is actually doing a study right now and, and you know, to look at the relief routes around San Angelo. Um, and, you know, the decision on uh, land owner right away, all of those uh, really would be part of what the district would do. And generally, you know, in this case, I couldn't tell you the timeline. That would be a specific question for the district, uh, you know, to answer because, again, that's really very project specific. And what we're doing right here is not project specific to the level of uh, relief uh, study and right away. Uh, you know, uh, discussion or acquisition, uh, parcel, parcel by parcel. So, uh, you know, um, we can certainly get you in touch with the San Angelo district and they can be able to help you with that, uh, to answer that question. Yeah, while we wait for any more questions to come in through the chat, and please feel free to unmute yourself and, uh, and ask the question using your phone or your computer if you'd like. Are there any other questions, thoughts, comments from anyone? Okay, I'm not uh, hearing any questions. I <clears throat> um, would like to definitely remind uh, that the public feedback is uh, very critical. Uh, so we definitely would like to hear from you. Um, so thank you very much for your participation. Again, a reminder that all comments are, must be received on or before Thursday, September 10th. Uh, please note that date again, it, it must be received Thursday, September 10th, 2020. That's the deadline to receive all the comments. That way we can incorporate your comments as part of the study. Um, again, uh, you know, if you go to techstar.gov and search for Ports of Plains, you should be able to find a lot of additional information about the study. If you'd like to submit comments by email, please use ports 2 planes at techstar.gov. That is the email ID that you will have to use. Or you could also use uh, mail in you can also mail in your comments. Um, uh, please use the address uh, Texas Department of Transportation, care of Ports to Plains study team. 
5835 Callahan Road, Suite 200, San Antonio, Texas 78228. And the same information is also available um, on the web page if you'd like. Uh, thank you. Thank you once again for your participation. Uh, greatly appreciate you all taking the time uh, to join us in the meeting today. Again, a quick reminder, if you could go back uh, to the virtual uh, web page and make sure you sign in or uh, and, uh, click on the comment box there to provide your comments, that, that would be helpful. Thank you again, everyone.